I went to visit his garage where he built an animated prehistoric beast on 16 millimeter film. Good Lord, what a friend to have. Someone just as crazy as I was about primeval monsters and how to get them into theaters and keep them there forever. We made a pact promising to grow old but never grow up. Terry, the interview, take one. Glad you guys are here. Cool, yeah, I do. Oh, are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Terry, one of the things about Monster Bash uh, that we really like is its uniqueness, uh, a very familial film uh, feel to it. Uh, a lot of places like Comic-Con, most people feel they've gone very commercial, very high energy, uh, very uncomfortable, whereas here you have a slightly older crowd, you have a lot of professionals, writers, collectors, archivists, even other filmmakers, and you even have a lot of families who come here. Uh, very old school. And we were just, your relationship with Steve, people have referred to you both as Bradbury's kids. Uh, how exactly did that come to be? How did you two come to know each other and know each other as Bradbury's kids? Well, actually, I knew of Steve Verdley long before I ever met him in, in person uh, through n knowing Forrest J. Ackerman and through knowing Ray Bradbury. And we grew up as part of a big family without really realizing we were all part of the same family, except through the pages of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine and through the films of uh, you know filmmakers like Roger Corman and Ray Harryhausen. And we were all part of this, this great world called fandom. Uh, who really sh were kindred spirits and shared the same passions and uh, sh shared the same interests and shared the same sense of imagination and wonder uh, through all of these different outlets that all came together through these conventions. And Monster Bash in particular uh, has really brought all of us together uh, at this stage in our lives. You know, I'm here with, with my wife and our two children. Uh, my oldest son, my, my, my only son, but my son, of course, is named Forrest after Forrest J. Ackerman. And, uh, you know, Steve and I were very fortunate that we were able to create uh, careers uh, really out of our interest and out of our passion and out of our, uh, our love for these films and for the works of writers like Ray Bradbury and Robert Block. And Steve wa was at the 1993 Famous Monsters of Filmland convention 20 years ago, 20 years ago this past May, uh, that was known as the Woodstock of Horror. And it sort of really brought all of us together under that same, uh, you know, sort of wonderful Famous Monsters umbrella. And that's where so many of us uh, reunited. And Steve was involved with Fanex and the Fanex conventions and was writing about these films. And meanwhile, I was a journalist, working journalist, working for the New York Times Company. And I was writing about these films as well and interviewing a lot of the people who had been my, you know, my boyhood idols. And so we sort of shared the same parallel paths uh, and Steve's a little older than I am. Uh, so he got a chance to meet in person some of these folks that I didn't get to meet, like Vincent Price. 
uh, and uh, you know, looking at his website and looking through some of the things he's posted, you know, he has photos with a lot of the people that I wish that I had met. But then we shared uh, this kinship really with, uh, with a lot of the folks that were still alive for our generation to experience at these conventions like Forey and like Ray Bradbury and like Ray Harryhausen. And we really did become like family uh, long before we ever really knew each other. And I remember seeing Steve at the 1993 Famous Monsters Convention. I had seen photos of him. And I remember speaking to him. So we met 20 years ago. We really didn't reunite in person until this Monster Bash uh, just a few years ago when Steve returned to the Monster Bash. And uh, we had a nice talk then, but uh, uh, I've been reading his work you know, in the pages uh, of, of these magazines, especially his work on film music, on Bernard Herrmann and Miklos Rosa and Jerry Goldsmith. And these were all, uh, you know, seminal names uh, that were behind the scenes names, but are very important to the research that I'm doing on Ray Bradbury and some of his film and television work, particularly the Bernard Herrmann piece, Bernard per Herrmann piece that he did on Hitchcock and Herrmann, which has become kind of the cornerstone of scholarship there. Uh, so we share a lot. We share a, we share a lot of, uh, uh, of interest and passions and friends and experiences and events like Monster Bash, you know, kind of bring us together under that, under that bond of kinship. The white whale tasks me. He heaps me. Yet he is but a mask. Tis the thing behind the mask I chiefly hate. The malignant thing that has plagued and frightened man since time began. The birds. The birds! He rises! In some respects, uh, genre, particularly the horror genre, uh, some people sort of think of as the red-headed stepchild mm -hmm. of the film world. But it refuses to die. Mm -hmm. It refuses to roll over. Uh, especially in times of social fear and crisis, uh, you see a spike in the popularity of genre, and horror in particular. Why do you think in a world of 9-11s and Boston bombings that genre is important? Why do people need it, or do they at all? Well, you know, Steve's written a lot about Hitchcock, and if you uh, if you if you look at uh, the the works of Hitchcock, you know, Hitchcock's been called the artist of, of anxiety, and uh, the genre has always reflected, you know, really what the fears and anxieties uh, are uh, of the general public at that point. You know, one of the the writers. Uh, in horror scholarship, David J. Scholes wrote, wrote a book called The Monster Show, which really reflects all of the current trends over the years in horror films and how they reflected what was going on uh, in society. And really, that's been that, that's been true for you know the past 200 years. But going back all the way to, to fairy tales and primal fears, you know, fear in, you know, fear of the unknown, you know, fear of the unknown. And I think that's why the classic horror, the gothic horror, you know, remains kind of mythic and kind of uh, you know primal and kind of Part of our part of the core of our being, and it's a bond that we share: the fear of the unknown, and it's also it taps into our imagination. It taps into uh, you know our sense of, of sense of wonder of uh, the the highest of the high and the lowest of the low. You know, uh, and a writer like Ray Bradbury could envision us at our best, but also could envision us at our worst, and our deepest, darkest fears, and our darkest impulse. Thirty-nine, a fine year, still young. Thirty-nine, come. Oh, oh, forty, forty, and here your old, old heart. Dad, no, don't listen. And is that the voice of green grass and sunshine, sweet Eden's child, the innocent young will? Two, three, three, four, three, five, three, six, three, seven, three, eight, three, nine, fifty, fifty-two. You are lost. Ray Bradbury always says, "Love is the answer to everything," and to be able to tell them, you know, I love you and love your work, and it has really made a difference, a transformative difference, you know, in my life. 
you know, has, has, has been really central to me. And that really led to, to a lot of what I've done professionally in interviewing a lot of these people, into recording their history, to doing oral histories, and then to put those together into, into interview pieces, to feature stories, uh, writing books. I'm working on a book on, on Ray Bradbury right now, and I think Steve has done a lot, of, a lot of the same thing. So given the opportunity of sitting down for an hour with Ray Bradbury, and owning a piece of memorabilia, I would take you know the the personal contact and uh, that that wonderful experience. You know, in talking about Steve, long before I really knew him on a personal level, he's a name I could bring up, and it would bring a smile to the faces of of guys like Ray Bradbury and Forrest J. Ackerman. So there's a generosity and a kinship, of spirit, of gentleness, of of positive uh, spirit there. That I think we that we all share that binds us together the cycle of, of creativity the cycle of creativity and wonder.